and welcome Ray's Junior Game. Today I'm David Levin. This is our Friday episode, so we're talking all things inner game. Tuesdays are for sports and sports parenting. Fridays are for everyone. And once again, today we are joined by Michelle Thomas, marriage and family therapist. Michelle, how are you? How was your holiday? Thank you for having me again. Um, my holiday was good. Um, gosh, it was a little bit of everything. It was relaxing and time with family and then also um, busy and traveling and seeing family, uh, you know, extended yeah. family and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, we were all healthy, knock on wood. Um, I know I've talked to some families that were sick during part of that time, yeah. but we had um, just a pretty good, like chaotic, fun um you know, as best as you can expect with four children. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I like How about you? that. You know, pretty great. We we do normally travel between Christmas and New Year's, but we didn't this year. Margaret was working. And so we stuck around. And uh, there's a lot to be said for that <laughs> yes. as far as the crazy factor. To simplify um, I like what you said, too, about the, I already forgot, but sort of the crazy fun that, yeah. you know, that they, they kind of go together, right? It is yep. nuts. And I like it. It's just really alive and energetic and yeah. dynamic and I imagine it being I imagine missing it as we get into empty nest yeah. phase exactly. right yeah. yeah all right well let us jump on in we'll start in with the ups and downs I'll go first on this one so uh, the ups column for me this is sort of related to Christmas but um, I got this uh, electric scooter for Christmas. It's like, it looks, oh, I say scooter, they call it that. It was like a mini bike. It's like a sit down, almost like a little mini motorcycle. And I talked about that in an earlier episode, but um, the, the thing that got, it was an up for me this week was uh, I wanted to customize it a little bit to be able to, you know, run to the store and, and take, you know, groceries and stuff. And um, it's just, this is the kind of project that is just the most fun thing for me imaginable. So I'm, I'm just trying to look at the thing and figure out how I could do this and how I could do that. And I'm always thinking of, you know, I get your initial ideas and then you keep drilling down. Oh, it can get simpler and simpler. Um, this is on Wednesday. And I was just up wired to like midnight, just thinking about it and playing with it and coming up with stuff. And um, the next morning I came up with, uh, well, I was, there were two things I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to take a, just jump on there for a quick ride for like a one grocery bag trip. And I also knew that a lot of times it's, I need more than one bag of groceries. So I wanted another system for that. And uh, I woke up the next morning, cracked them both about an hour and a half. I had it all done. And nice. it, it's a silly thing, but I just cannot get over how much that lights me up, that kind of thing, that kind of creative. I want to say bite size, like I can get the idea and so suss it out and solve it within a day mm. and, uh, and come up with something practical. Oh my goodness! That's just, and I, I, I'm sure that speaks to the fact that everybody has their own wiring. That's not the case for others, but for me, uh, yeah. th there's nothing that makes me um, feel more alive and satisfied and full of myself. Like the whole time, as soon as I'm done, the whole next day, I'm like, whenever we got home, I'm like, "Hey, come look!" I, yeah. just, I had to show everybody. You know, it's like, "Mom, look at me!" But man, that lit me up. And then another little one was um, uh, we had a kind of a short notice thing this last week, but Francis and I went uh, skiing in Mount Lacrosse. Uh, it was a school related sort of thing. And it was this crazy, you talk about crazy fun. Um, it was a really warm night. It was the night skiing because I have this deal on a lift tickets there. And it's hardly even called skiing. Honestly, it's such a small place, but you know, it's better than nothing, uh, or at least it can be, but it was raining this night, or at least it started to rain. And there was one particular run we were going up on the chairlift and it was just, it was practically pouring. I mean, the rain was just pooling up on our jackets and our pants and stuff. And it was just insane. But uh, by the time we got to the bottom, it had been kind of long lines that night at the chairlift. By the time we got to the bottom of the hill, we were like the only ones there. Everybody else had totally cleared. And, and the rain had stopped at that point. <laughs> so we were able to continue on. A little bit and it was you know it wasn't great but the thing that was great about it was just doing it together and having it be out of the ordinary and having some stories to tell about it so that was just super great and then quick on to my uh, down and then we'll get to yours so uh, Peter is in this uh, you know college application phase right now 
-hmm. and it's kind of insane. And we were working on a video. He has to do a little video introduction of himself for one of the schools he's applying to. And uh, we sat down together to collaborate on this. And we spent like six hours straight just sitting at the computer. <laughs> and it, it, it passed my limit. <laughs> I, I really clicked into another sort of mode where I got really crabby and I snapped at him and he snapped back at me. And uh, again, it still has some of that crazy fun element to me because, you know, big picture, uh, I actually loved it. I uh, loved seeing how common we are. I mean, like he was super impatient with me. Like I was manning the controls because I know the apps better. And he was saying, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And he was getting impatient with me as the operator. And I was like, what, 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 you get off me. Yeah. <laughs> but but if it had been reversed, I would have been the exact same, you know? And um, seeing how focused he was on the ideas that they came up and trying to make sure they got executed right. And, and the ideas were really great. Everything he wanted us to do was really great. So I loved it at a big picture. But in the moment, I definitely clicked into a different version of myself. Not my yeah. favorite one. It worked out fine, but uh, I thought it was worth mentioning just because that's what happens to us, right? I mean, that's the whole yeah. core of the framework for my stuff is that triggers turn yeah. us into different versions, lesser versions of ourselves. And um, the key to uh, limiting that is to be aware of it and have this, you know, some skills to do that. But, so that was my down, was my massive video editing session. All right, <laughs> that's me. How about you, ups and downs? Ups and downs. Um so I am someone who I really love when the kids are off or they get two weeks off. And so the first week is kind of fun. The chaos is fun and um, it's loud and kids are hap mostly happily playing, you know, whatever. And I can like tolerate that. I was definitely um, an up for me this week is just to get everyone back into a schedule because by the end, we're all a little bit like, bored, maybe sick of being together all the time, it's pretty much straight. Um, so for me, yeah, for sure, getting back to work for me, school for the kids, um, and just figuring out what is this uh, January schedule, you know, going to fall into because now, you know, activities have changed. One of my daughters is in a play. Um, another one has got some babysitting gigs and my son is in futsal this winter. And so that's all going to be starting up in the next couple of weeks. It's not there yet. So I, I actually thrive under like organization and planning and I can handle those, you know, few weeks of, um, or a couple of weeks of, you know, just kind of chaos and fun and, you know, people get up whenever they want and stuff. But I, an up for me is that we're all kind of getting back on track. And then my second up is that um, on New Year's Day, I released my some a new thumbnail for my podcast, um, Women's Fire, which we talked about last time. But I had a local artist design it for me. And um, the more I look at it, the more I love it. It exactly captures um, what I what I want it to be and what I I where the inspiration came from. And so um, that was just really thrilling, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback from that. So. Nice. Yeah, it was exciting. Okay, and my down is that, um, so earlier this week I had a migraine, and migraines are new mm -hmm. for me in that it's been about maybe the last three years that they've been an issue for me, but I've really been trying to learn about them and what mm -hmm. triggers them, and I feel like I, I have it down now where they're they're kind of predictable actually just based on my cycle and hormones but then added any stress or like overindulgence in certain types of foods or things like that but i did have a migraine this week and it just is so disruptive and it's you know i i've had headaches my whole life that's kind of like my achilles heel you know even as a kid you know that um i don't have like stomach issues or back issues or something like some people do, but um, having migraines and understanding more what that is has been, that's kind feels kind of new for me still. And it's like a reminder how it can take one, two, three, sometimes four days out of your week. Oof. Luckily this was just one day, but I did work that day. And so it was a bit of a, you know, I feel great today and it's almost hard 
to remember maybe what that feels like, but when you're in it, it just feels so overwhelming. And mm-hmm. um, so that was that was a bit of a downer. Yikes. I don't think I ever get those. I When I was much, much younger, every once in a while I'd get a really bad headache. And my only memory of it is I was on the road with bands back then and uh, I would just pound NyQuil. I mean, as dumb as that sounds, oh. I would take like double batches of NyQuil and kind of knock myself out. And sure. then I would be gone. But something that started uh, much later, I get what I've heard referred to like a migraine halo. Have you heard those? I've heard of this, yes. It's like the the biomechanics of it without the pain. So I get this moving uh, visual cloud, this sparkly field um, that I can't see through. It's like it, it, it blocks out whatever I'm looking at and yep. it will it'll just start start coming in and it'll move through my field of vision uh, 15, 30 minutes or so. And like I, I, you know, it's really disorienting because it's like, you know, you can't read or it's like right half of a word or whatever, but it moves through fairly quickly. And I get a little bit of just kind of queasy after it, but that's it really. And uh, I think I'm pretty thankful (laughs) if that's, I mean, if I don't know how I would deal with an actual multi-day headache i don't think i would do well with that at all yeah it's it kind of shifted for me where i started to realize it was migraines was they're like pain relievers don't do much right they maybe keep it at bay but i have a whole list of other like warm baths and epsom salt getting a massage from my husband um napping which i'm not great at but that actually is super helpful um Mm. doing um like I roll on like a foam roller because it, it's it it's linked to tension in my neck and back. Oh, sure. Anyway, so it is it's more the pain in like kind of brain fog than it is. Um, I, I have never had the visual components, mm. but I know it yeah. they it's it's a little bit of a medical mystery still like yeah. headaches and all of yeah. that. So anyway, I had right, one well, this week and it was thanks a little for bit sharing. of a <laughs> yeah. Those are ups and downs. And again, we share them just to point out to all of us that we all get these things, right? Yep. Ups and downs are part of life. Did you guys ever do the rose and thorn thing at dinner? Yep. Yes. Yeah. This is just basically yep. that, right? Yep. And uh, and I always found it super helpful just just to keep that in your mind. There, Every day has ups and downs and roses and thorns. Mm-hmm. All right. Those are ups and downs. Next up, the Raise Your Inner Game Weather Report. All right, our inner game weather, sort of along the same track. Michelle, how's your inner game today and what's your coming week look like? Um, All in all, I feel like my inner game is good. Um, Like I said, I I like that we're getting back to a schedule and we're kind of organizing. And um, I feel like as my kids are getting older, I have a lot more bandwidth for my life in prioritizing my health and mental health and things like that. So um, I'm, I like the beginning of the year to not necessarily make resolutions, but set intentions. And I feel like I've been intentional about um, doing that this year again, and um, thinking about, you know, just reflecting on where we were last year, what might happen this year, we have a whole year before us, hopefully. And, um, so yeah, I feel good. I feel good in my work. I feel good in my home. I feel good in my marriage. I feel good with my kids. Everything's good right now. <laughs> um, the coming week also looks good in that, um, like I said, some activities are gonna be starting and things are going to get intense maybe the second half of the month, but I feel like there's always this like couple week lull in January where no one, none of that has started yet. And so I'm just enjoying the fact that um, we're there's almost no after school activities these next two weeks. Mm. Um, we're just kind of keeping it cool. Um, I'm going to be seeing some friends tomorrow and spending some time with them. So that is good. And just enjoying the fact that that it's kind of simple this week. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, for me uh, today, I'm a little stressed out. 
<laughs> this is the this is the application day, and mm -hmm. um, got a few things going on work wise that need to be done, like this, for example. Yep. Um, but this is also, I mean, we've got till midnight tonight, and I just have got this feeling that we're going to be clicking the button on those last couple of portfolio pieces at eleven fifty eight, and. I'm, I'm telling myself that story and getting stressed out in advance about it, but <laughs> things feel a little bit frantic and uh, and desperate and that, that kind of worry like, oh my God, what's going to, like just for example, we're taking, he's got this portfolio he's got to submit and there's like a dozen pieces in there and I've been trying to set up here and get good pictures of them um, and they're okay. I mean, they're good enough, but they're it's a lot of work and they're never, they don't seem perfect, you know? So I thought, oh, this is going to be great. We'll just we'll go over to the printer, get scans of them. They'll be perfectly clean and clear and square, and that'll save me a ton of time. So this morning before this, I run over, I take them over to the printer, um, half a dozen pieces, and I go back and pick them up, and they're just awful. They're completely oh. unusable. It's like they were stuck on a photocopier or something. So, so, so that was one errand in the day that ended up going the wrong direction. And now I'm like, yeah. oh, we're gonna take more pictures. There's three or four pieces that aren't done yet. He has to finish up today to get in tonight. So he's got to finish them, sign off on them. Then we got to take pictures and get them uploaded. So I'm a little stressed. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be fine. And it might be crazy today too. <laughs> and I've got another thing this afternoon, a work thing I've got to do. And I'm supposed to get to the gym today. And I've been really good about not letting you know, other kinds of obligations keep me from that. But today might, uh, I might not get there either. Yeah. But uh, I'm sure it's going to be fine. And it might be a little tough. It so, usually so, is, right? Yeah, yeah, it usually In is. In the end. Yeah. And I mean, it's also true that some days are just not, right? I mean, they, sometimes they just are tough. And, uh, and, then the, and then you move on. But um, so my job today is to not let my worry about how it might be be a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just try and stay clear enough and focused, and you know, yeah. uh, to make things go as smoothly as possible. The week well, coming kind up. It's kind of an interesting. Sorry, it's kind no, of an interesting ahead. thing though, because when you say that about um, thinking ahead of how it might be, like on one hand, that's good preparation and setting man like expectations, right? Yeah. Of like, this just might be really hard. Yeah. You know, it's like, what's that line between right. setting an expectation that's probably realistic versus, um, like you said, a self-fulfilling prophecy that yeah. this is going to be stressful and then it's going to be stressful. So I think that's yeah. a, I don't think either one of those is right. Yeah. I guess I would yeah. say, right? Like, it, it just, it's just going to be what it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the right one. That's the right conclusion yeah. there. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the week coming, um, it is opening up. I totally agree with everything you said about it's nice to kind of get the rhythms back. I love those two. Reminds me of that, that line from beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Frances just asked me about that the other day. She says, I'm not sure I get the joke, but it's the, and mom and dad can hardly wait for school to start again. Right, yeah. that line? <laughs> I'm like, well, there's a lot of truth in that, at least for those of us who love rhythms and having the kids be away for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I'm still sort of in the shaking off the fog of the holidays a little bit like I'm eager to get back to the work but I'm also aware that I'm not quite sharp enough as sharp as I'd like to be to really take advantage of it but it's just it's always a transition for me um, so nothing really external uh, that I can look at that would be uh, you know something to worry about but just I gotta I gotta keep pushing to fully get the fog off before yeah. I'm really um, feeling as effective as I could be. All right, that is our Inner Game Weather Report. How about you out there in the audience? How are you feeling today? And what do you expect in the coming week and the coming year? It is sort of fun to think ahead for the year, although I don't really do much of that classic um, resolution stuff either. Anyway, think about that. We'll move on to our top stories. All right, top stories. The big one for me, I'm not even sure how I feel about it really, but it's this whole thing with the Congress and trying to get the speaker election. You've been following that a little bit? Yeah, that was my top story too. Oh, yeah. It's just, I mean, there's many layers to it. On the one hand, it's super sad, right? I mean, it's just, it's embarrassing for our country. Um, 
I, on the other hand, I have to confess a little bit. I, I think I've really come to fully appreciate the meaning of schadenfreude. Um, I'm really having a certain amount of pleasure in watching them struggle. I, I, I can't help it. <laughs> but just um, kind of on a bigger picture, it strikes me, this is what happens. This is what you get when you let the crazy out in people, when you encourage it like they do, when you invite people into your group who don't live in the factual world, who don't operate in good faith. And as a leader, when you don't actually have a vision, it's just about you and your ego and wanting the title and all that. Of course, the group is going to break down and stop working, right? I mean, what do you expect? Groups only work when they can operate on common facts and communicate and share a common vision. And uh, of course, it's going to be a catastrophe. And even if they, you know, at some point, they're going to get somebody in there, but this is not going to be the last day of chaos, right? I mean, by definition, they just, they've broken themselves. They've broken their system. And it would be funny if it weren't so important. Mm -hmm. And of course, on the Tolstoy rating, good for humanity, this really serves nobody. Just nobody. It's just a mess. Uh, it's just nothing really good to say about it, except it's a little fun to, fun to watch in the short term. So that's me. Right. What are you thinking about it? You know, I think what I'm thinking about it is that I am... I have I I follow politics and news. Um, I, I try to keep it on the periphery for my own mental health, but I'm definitely I'm in on it. I I read the New York Times morning briefing every morning and read articles that I think are interesting. But the truth is, sometimes I have to just scroll through like the main story if it's about politics because it brings me so much like angst to see yeah, yeah. the chaos um, that exists. So. When I was reading a little bit about this, I was, well, I didn't really know what I expected. I mean, again, yes, it was like, wow, look at this mess that um, is in the aftermath of these many years of just kind of chaos in our political system. But when I realized that the, the problem they're having right now is between someone who some would consider to be extreme in and of itself, uh, in, in himself and Kevin McCarthy, but also it's actually the more extreme that are having problems with it and they want someone representing them and they're the holdouts and he was going to make concessions. So it, it's not moving toward moderation. It's just moving more extreme. And so if those concessions are granted and they agree to vote for him, that, that feels scary to me. So, yeah. Sometimes I just try to keep in mind that this is history and right now living in it feels very angsty, but that in there's, you know, our U.S. government has been through a lot of changes and really scary times and really divisive times. And um, that doesn't mean this can't lead eventually to something very, very serious, but um, it's it's not the first time this has happened in history either. And so I'm, I try to just remain curious about mm -hmm. how will this resolve? Mm -hmm. What will, when I'm, you know, 70 or 80, hopefully, um, be talking about what it was like to, to grow up, to be an adult or parent or whatever during these times where it just felt so, um, so hard to to have yeah faith in our government and and feel like people are really working for us and and things like that and maybe <laughs> i mean the scary thing is right these could be the glory days or feel like oh my gosh i'd rather go back to that depending on how yeah. it ends up or it could be like wow what a mess that was and glad something got figured out along the way or someone came yeah. along or cooler heads prevailed or the new generations you know i don't know what you know teens and 20 something year olds who are going to run our country in 20 years from now, 30 years from now are, are learning about this and what they're going to yeah. bring to the table. But yeah, yeah, it's definitely on my mind. Yeah. I mean, you talk about the concession just reading this morning, uh, you know, one that they had been pushing for, I, I forget what, the, what it's actually called, but basically it has to do with the number of house members required before they can demand a particular vote to vacate the chair, I think is what it is, right? And there was, he originally wanted like 50% and then negotiated down to five and they were asking for one. And I, last I heard, he agreed for that. 
So mm-hmm. any any one of those guys, any or men or women, of course, any day of the week can just get up and say, we're going to vote you out. So he has no control at all, no resistance at all. Right. And, the, you know, I, I mentioned the earlier, I made the link to the ego. He, so he is in a position where he has to say, either I keep giving in to these demands or I step back and let somebody else run for it, right? Um, he has to know that giving in to these will only damage their effectiveness and, you know, the country. There's just no question about it. That's why he resisted it so hard before. So the only reason he's giving in to them now is because he wants to be the speaker even though it's it's like saying, I want to own this car so desperately that I will, you can take, you can keep the engine, you can keep the wheels, you can keep everything in there. I, I just the seat. I want, I want to sit in this car and have it be my own. And it's so dumb. And again, it would be funny if it weren't so completely dangerous, but his ego is really driving this thing. You know this this problem, and it's only it's going to be awful because <laughs> these crazy. I was reading some more about some of the stuff they want, why they want the power they want. It's because they basically want to burn it down. They just are are they are of the mind that, for example, ever ever increasing the debt limit should never be done. So now they want the power to stop that from happening, and oh my goodness, yeah, yeah. I should probably do more like you and skip the, some of those articles. Yeah, I mean, I do, I guess because I know people who spend a lot of time, um, it, it can, it's so scary. You can get obsessed about it, right? You want to be yeah. reassured. You want to know more or whatever. But I yeah. also see those people as being particularly angsty. And it's similar, honestly, for me with like climate change, oh, which I know yeah. is a very real true thing. But I can't live my life in panic and anxiety about that like I need to also find joy and laughter and freedom, (laughs) you know, like space, I guess I would say to, um, to, to enjoy like the little things and, and not constantly be in a state of worry because it would be really easy to fall into that. I feel like. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I feel the effects of that, that baseline stress. There have been periods where I have uh, set myself up. I did this for quite a while, actually. Uh, I have this thing where I track certain activities every day and I crack them like a spreadsheet and um, just pay attention to whether I do them or not, things that are either good for me or not good for me. And I spent a pretty long time um, just literally not looking at the news at all for six days a week. We had this magazine called The Week that did a summary of everything. We used to get that. And that actually worked pretty well. I mean, I was I always knew it was going on. I wasn't completely out of touch, but um, I wasn't having that urgent, that quasi-urgent, you know, daily obsessive checking. So the problem I have is twofold. It's the uh, it's the stress of the information. But I also just get very uh, obsessive about checking. Like I will, you know, when I'm in the checking mode, I will check the news, you know, 10 times a day. Mm-hmm. And and in case something new has come up, you know, that's kind of the, it's, it's, like, it's almost like a dopamine thing. It's like, oh, yeah. there's something interesting. And so... Uh, just that kind of obsessive state is so suboptimal for me. So maybe I'm talking myself into trying to take a break. But it just has felt like lately um, there are some big pending things that I really want to hear when they come. I guess the big thing is some potential indictment, you know, for Trump. So, But I'm going to have to try and scale back a little bit because it's not, it's making me a little more crabby when Peter wants to do some video editing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Anyway, excellent. That is our um, top stories this week. Next up. Our quote of the week. All right, the quote of the week. This week we will hear from Benjamin Disraeli. Whenever I hear that name, I always assume it has to do with Israel. I guess that's not a surprise, but it actually has nothing to do with that. Um, He was actually British, lived in the 1800s, was prime minister twice. And his quote this week for us is, Action may not always bring happiness, but there is no happiness without action. Action may not always bring happiness, but there is no happiness without action. So for me, that actually feels sort of helpful starting a new year. I mentioned I was kind of in that fog, kind of sluggish. feels like it's a big hill to climb. 
But at the same time, I totally know nothing will happen. Nothing I want, nothing I'm excited about will happen without acting on it. So might as well, you know, just buck it up and get moving. So, uh, and there's, there's certainly more uh, to say and think about that, but those are the main things for me. So I wonder how you, how that strikes you. Um, yeah, I agree that, I guess it's interesting, happiness and action, like what, what do each of those mean or entail? Yeah. Um, I, I do think, yes, that if, if one is discontent or struggling or whatever, there needs to be movement, like a shift in, in any direction, which would be an action. Um, when I see that too, I also think about this movement toward, um, I'm going to call inaction, which is happiness coming from not like relaxing, resting, um, being okay with what is, um, not constantly fighting or hustling or whatever that, you know, to, to try to like self-improvement, you can get burned out from that of always trying mm -hmm. to, to do better. So I guess I would say mm -hmm. it, it's a balance, right? You need both in your life. I mean, there's, yeah. um, you can be an extreme in either way, you know, yeah. extremely inactive and not moving your life along, but you can also be, um, working, hustling, you know, just trying to get that next thing or, or reading all the books or listening to all the podcasts or whatever it is and, and also miss out on the rest and the relaxation and the rejuvenation and the tending to um, yourself and your relationships close to home and things like that. Yeah, so Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I actually think that, um, and this is probably a little overthinking, uh, <laughs> typical overthinking yeah. on my part, but I think when you think, like you say, I think it's right to to drill in on the connection between action and happiness, which is the point of his quote. When I think of happiness um, in a deeper way, I think of just sort of the level you're operating at, um, just attention-wise and energy-wise. Um, and so what I'm getting at is, uh, when I think of action in that context, I'm more thinking of uh, intentionality and mm -hmm. being kind of awake and conscious versus being just sort of reactive and sleepwalking, uh, so to speak. So even if, and I totally agree with what you're saying about uh, the need for quiet and rest and rejuvenation and connection and all that stuff. But um, when I think about that, I think even that requires actual intentionality and will because the easy thing to do in those cases is to turn on the TV, for example, or and not do anything, stay in bed and eat the extra piece of chocolate cake. And, you know, all these things that um, they strike us as a, a move towards comfort, but they're actually not. They actually end up, they contribute to that downward spiral of sort of lack of, you know, feeling good about ourselves and, and just feeling alive. So uh, for me, e even like sitting down intentionally to take a nap, you know, is an act of will. It's an act of, oh, but I really need this right now. This is good for me. I'm going to resist the pulls or pulling me away from that. I'm going to make this decision right now. So uh, I think even at that level, the quote still works. But like, yeah. but you know, on the surface, obviously, it seems like, you know, movement versus stillness, which is not always the best. But I like it all the way down into that moment to moment mental game stuff. Yeah. Does that make sense? It totally does. Yeah. I totally agree. Well, and also it's a 18, you know, he was in the 1800s or whatever. Well, that's a good point century too. Quote. So, um, yeah. that yeah. when you say intention, you know, that's a word we use a lot now, um, yeah. meaning, yeah, behavior, action, even if that action is rest, choosing yeah. rest or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I really, I don't need to belabor it, but I really think of it as attention control. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, you can almost always drill down and, and tag it as that. What What am I doing with my thoughts right now? Am I, am I intentionally focusing my attention where it serves me, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and all of those sort of lazy-ish, you know, um, Eckhart Tolle had this great, 
uh, illustration comment one time. He was ta- he was talking about the context was the burden of thought, the burden of how we tend to live in this unending stream of mental noise. That's just our natural, pretty much everyone's natural state, and it is exhausting. And but it's and it is our natural state. And he said there's two ways to uh, find relief from that. One, he said, and maybe you probably know this stuff, you remember, is to go below thought, which is all those things we just talked about, maybe having a cocktail, maybe just vegging out, just not thinking of, you know, numbing, soft, you know, all that stuff. The other is to go above thought, where you can actually step back from it and still it and kind of it's meditative kind of practice and stuff like that. And that's what I feel like. That back, That's kind of what I was saying too with it. That above thought is a more enlivening, an effective and relieving path, but it requires intention. It requires a uh, will force and a strength of its own, but it's more satisfying. You know, it's like if you're thirsty, you can have a Coke or you can have a glass of water. Um, yeah. The water is going to feel more deeply satisfying. Anyway, you, yeah. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love Eckhart Tolle. So, yes, yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Excellent. All right. That is our quote for the week. Action may not always bring happiness. That's definitely true. But there's no happiness without action. And we think that's probably true, too, depending on how you think about it. So think about that for yourself, what actions you can take to get the year started off on a good track. And we'll move on to raise your outer game. All right, raise your outer game. This is where we talk about the things we care about in our outer life, our health, our relationships, our finances. And this week, since we have Michelle here, what are we talking about, Michelle? What do you want to share with us this week? Yeah, so for this week, something that's coming up for me a lot, um, I mean, it's true in my personal life, it's always been true, but it's also coming up for some clients. Um, you had asked me about like, you know, families I work with and kind of what mm-hmm. what's what are some themes. And so um, right now a theme is that tending to your own mental health and your relationship in in particularly in a, let's say a two parent household or whatever, um, that those things tending to your life and your mental health and your relationships actually is a, maybe if not the largest, a very big component of being a good parent. Hmm. You know, a lot of times when children are um, anxious, stressed, um, acting out, it's often the energy they're feeling in the family. Maybe there's tension, maybe a parent's totally stressed out, maybe there's um, conflict in the relationship or your, um, you know, finances are tight or whatever. And like, you might not be discussing that in front of the kids, but they're, they're sensing some kind of tension um, and then needing and wanting attention or, or acting out in some way. So it's interesting because some kids that I've worked with, their families, um, we're kind of pivoting to work on relationship stuff because I actually really enjoy working with couples and um, believe that like a strong relationship is a huge part of a strong family, Um, that you have to be not just like good, um, like parenting is one thing, you parent together, you also like run a household together, but you're also a couple. And if that, you can do those other two things really well. You can do like basic parenting, your schedule, getting kids to school, making food, stuff like that. You can run a household really well together, paying bills, cleaning, whatever. But if the couple is struggling, then that really does permeate into the rest of the family. So I've been um, working with couples uh, or families on couple work so that they're feeling... um, seen and held and loved and supported and all of that. And once they're full in that way, then they, you know, can have that much more to give to their children and the, the family structure. Hmm. Well, that makes perfect sense. I, I mean, <laughs> again, I, all of my, all of my parenting um, insight basically comes from having read Kim Champagne. Um, yeah. But he really talks about that, that a lot of times the, um, well, one part of it that the, uh, the behavior in the kids that we consider, you know, acting out or whatever, is really them trying to, they're responding to a feeling of sort of a lack of safety, a lack of mm-hmm. security in their life in general. And, you know, if they're sensing that 
ten tension, conflict, disconnect in the relationship. It totally makes sense that would do that. So I'm, I'm, I know it's different for every situation, but there's some sort of just some like 101 relationship stuff, the kind of things you find yourself saying over and over that maybe some would not intuit or they know it, but they don't do it. What are the top things, sure. one or two things you come to mind you have parents, have a couple's work on, parent couples? Yeah. So I'm a big fan of John Gottman's work. I don't know if you're familiar know. with mm -mm. him at all, but um, he, well, I won't go into John Gottman. People can Google <laughs> if they want and we can put, post a link um, with the video. But um, so he has written a book that I use a lot um, called The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. Okay. He also has a book called The Relationship Cure. That's also a good one. But The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, something that he um, talks about in the very beginning is that there's something called the four horsemen of the apocalypse in a relationship yeah. that yeah. if they exist, it can be really hard to to have any sort of successful relationship if those things are happening. Hmm. And so um, one of them is defensiveness. You know, if someone's, if a, if your partner comes to you and is expressing like a criticism or a critique or they're upset about something and you're just defensive, that's, that's no go. Um, another thing is if you're constantly criticizing your partner, well, you're lazy, you're like, instead of, instead of complaining, you're criticizing like mm -hmm. their person. Mm -hmm. um, condemning your partner like that like essentially treating them like they're not worthy of your mm -hmm. respect um mm -hmm. which that's probably the worst one and then stonewalling is the fourth one and mm -hmm. that is where um you just kind of get flooded with emotion and you ignore um like your partner's talking to you and you're just like not responding totally mm -hmm. ignoring whatever mm -hmm. and so um I don't have them all right now, um, but we can link, there's like a handout for this, but I've been handing cool. out this um, handout of what the four horsemen are and then what the um, the antidotes to those are, oh. which is like respectful listening, um, you know, being grateful for your partner and not, um, you know, like understanding that they are a person, um, connection, you know, things like that, that are the antidotes mm. to the four horsemen. And that's, to me is like pretty basic. That's like 101 that if, mm -hmm. if these things are happening in your relationship, that your very first priority is to mm. shift that out mm. of having those four components. Yeah. As you mentioned them, every one of them, I was like, Oh, no, I don't want yeah. that. I don't like no, that. It seems it's very obvious, but um, believe it or not, you know, we're so many people are just triggered. They have their own trauma and things that they're, that they haven't yeah. dealt with. And so, um, even if there, there's sometimes only one of those things that is present, but it can be, yeah. but they're, they're, they're the four main things because they eat any one of them can be really detrimental to For the sure. relationship. And yeah, defensiveness another... is probably the most common okay. that we get defensive when our partner complains about us. You know, that reminds <laughs> me, um, I had a, before my, uh, raise your game, book my, my previous book before that was called uh, don't just talk be heard it was a communications mm -hmm. book and one of the tenets of that was that there's this huge gap typically between what we think we're saying and what people hear from us and um and to the extent we can close that everything gets you know miraculously better but so there there's a whole bunch of examples of like how people can say things in a way that is actually quite insulting and demeaning not, not even realizing at all, and of course not meaning that at all, but just somehow the way they say it comes off judgy and condescending and or defensive and all those things, and it's so destructive. And the the context of that was always uh, workplace stuff, but I can imagine that being super critical in uh, relationships, maybe even more so, personal relationships. So then, as far as just working with you, I'm just curious. Um, they've got to learn some of those skills. I'm I'm assuming a lot of it is. You know, you can undo a lot of the uh, the damage that's been done just through talking things through, but they've also got to learn new ways to talk, right, and new ways to be with each other. And that's just kind of the work you do in your sessions with them? Yeah, so depending on the level, I mean, sometimes we will, like, role play. You know, say, like, how can you say that? You know, mm -hmm. do you hear what your partner's telling you? Can you repeat that and then respond mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know, non-defensively or with gratitude or with, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, you know, the work is done at home and they, um, most of the couples I work with, I assign the book, you know, and then we go through, like read each chapter or, you know, and then check in about how it's going. So yeah, some need a little more handholding, I guess I would say, where we're like, okay, this is how it's done. This is the language. But but that's also all in the book of, you know, like this is how an argument could go. Here's another way to do it and gives mm. like actual language. And also once we start even identifying that's defensiveness, that's criticism, <laughs> that's um, stonewalling, that's what that's called, you know, that's, mm-hmm. um, you know, contempt yeah that's the the fourth one you know that that's what that language is now we have a language for that mm-hmm. to say that's not just you know some people especially when they're defensive they feel like well i'm just you know like they might even be right that they didn't mean to say that that way or whatever they mm-hmm. don't understand that regardless of their intention someone was hurt and now yeah. you need to listen yeah. to that and accept responsibility for that and yeah. so we might have to Oof. like piece. My favorite is when they can like bring an argument they had to session and we can like walk through it. (laughs) Like how did it start? Who said what? And kind of find all the places that it could have gone better Mm -hmm. or differently Mm -hmm. to, um, to prevent like a big blow up, you know, if that's what it ended up being or a 30 minute fight when it could have been a five minute fight or whatever. So that's good work, man. I mean, it's yeah. it's important work, hard work in a lot of cases, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. So basically, just uh, just to wrap this up, a, a really great place to start, and hopefully we can link to it in the notes, is just grab that uh, fl- that handout with the four horsemen yeah, on there. Yeah, there's a PDF you can print out. Yep. Just think through, are we doing some of these? And if so, maybe get the book and talk about trying to start Yeah, I would say, too, back. that... Um, the reason that comes up for families is not just for the couple, but especially when you have teenagers Mm. in the home, they, they're very, uh, they can, um, they do some of those behaviors as well. So then it's like, if you put it on the refrigerator, it's like in this family, we, we don't do these things. We do these things. Mm. You know, we listen to each other. We don't ignore each other, you know, things like that. So it's good for the whole family. Yeah. That's excellent. Thank you. I love it. Yeah. All right, that is our outer game. Next up, inner game gold. All right, inner game gold. So these are the ideas and concepts I come back to over and over. To help me stay on track and I share them because I assume they'll have the same uh, helpful effect on you. So this week, I thought I would go back to the opening quote from the book, the Raise Your Inner Game book, which is, from Leonardo da Vinci, the height of a person's success is gauged by their self-mastery. Uh, the height of a person's success is gauged by their self-mastery. I opened the book with that for a reason, right? I mean, the more I think about it uh, in my own life and the people I've worked with, just thinking it through in general, it really does seem to me that self-mastery is the key to everything we want. You think about the typical sort of resolutions people make if they do those, health, diet, self-care, relationship improvement. Every one of those things depends on overcoming the inner resistance to doing them. We all know uh, that we don't actually need to take more self-improvement courses. We know what we should be doing or some obvious things we could be doing to feel better and feel better about ourselves. It's the inner resistance that keeps us from doing them. So. If, if you really want to focus on self-improvement this year in the spirit of a resolution, this is the place to put your focus. It's on sort of the core self-mastery. That's my take anyway. That's why I, I'm, I'm helped by reminding myself of that kind of core tenet. I wonder, Michelle, how that strikes you. Right. So what's interesting, again, is I would say um, what is success and then also what is self-mastery? Because we were just talking about Congress and all those people were successful in getting to the highest level almost, you know, of their political career or whatever. Do they have self-mastery? 
Does Trump have self-mastery? He's incredibly successful, became president of the United States. By all measures, he's a successful man, right? Mm -hmm. I would, we might say, no, he doesn't have self-mastery. So yeah. it's, it's interesting to me, that's like a, um, almost like an apex of what most people or many people, I guess would say, right? That um, I, I agree with the tenets of it. I feel like success is, I don't even know what that is almost anymore. There's lots mm -hmm. of people who are successful who are really ignorant, really, um, gosh, I even, I, I, I use Tom Brady as an example, like possibly the best quarterback ever, at least for now, but not real great at relationship. <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. when he just went through his divorce. So also, what is a successful life, a whole life, right? Because there's mm -hmm. so many people who are really good at um, their one thing, but are, are maybe not an attentive parent because they're really into their job and they're really good at their job and they're successful at their job. So I feel like all those little components can change, you know, like it's, it's a it's a good general quote, but if you dig into it, there's there's also people that I've met who are like amazing people that I want to emulate and am like envious of, like their self confidence or their the way they communicate or whatever. But they have like super messy relationships or mm -hmm. don't parent the way I would want to parent my kids or something like that. So mm -hmm. if I if I were to be a therapist and pick that all apart and think of like all the context of all the people and the families and stuff that I work with. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a general rule of thumb. What, what okay. do you think? Excellent. So as I read it, I actually think he's saying, cause he says the height of their success is gauged by their self mastery. So I, what I think he's saying is um, if they haven't developed self mastery, no matter how it looks, they're not actually successful. Mm. They're not happy. They're not able to be of service to the people in their lives. The things that we really care about on our deathbed, the things that we praise other people for in their eulogies, it's never about their passing statistics. It's how were they as a person and how, how much equanimity, how much do they just live life and be of value to other people? because um, I'm reading that into that, but that gauged by says that sure. to me. So mm -hmm. that's that's my that's what it says to me. And that's why I find it helpful is because it reminds me that uh, that for the things that really will make us genuinely happy, where we can sit there at the end of the day and say, I am genuinely proud of how I was today, of who I am as a person. I mean, I don't know if anybody can say that all the time. But just generally on balance, that only comes, that experience only comes consistently as a result of our self-mastery because that's what, it, that's what the battle is about. The battle is about mo one moment to the next. Here's what I know is the right thing or the, the higher path thing to take in this moment, and I don't do it. Over and over again, I don't do it. I, I, I have the extra cookie. I snap at my kids, you know, whatever it is. Um, all those things that make us talk ourselves down or, or judge ourselves ill on balance are the result of a lack of self-mastery in that moment. So that's how I take it. I take it that the things I most profoundly, deeply care about uh, are all linked to that and, and really to nothing but that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, but, but I totally get what you're saying too. It really depends on what you mean by the word success. I think... His definition of success is written into that sentence because mm. of the word gauge, but maybe not. Maybe I'm giving him too much credit yeah. there. Well, I when I, I guess I would say you and I are similar enough to feel, I, I would agree with the quote for myself personally. I don't know if everyone has, I don't know if, as a society, we are agreed on what are those things that we want to feel proud of at the end of the day? What are those things that we want to feel good about on our deathbeds? What are yeah. the things that are praised in a eulogy? Like, yeah. not everyone is, um, 
their goal isn't necessarily to be um, like generous, patient, kind, helpful, mm-hmm. you know? So it, mm-hmm. for me, it's less about what the, how that resonates for me personally. And yeah. if that's something that, um, yeah, I think of like TikTok stars, YouTubers, things, you know, they're 20 some year old and, and you're right. Like they have a certain kind of success, but like if I was a teenager thinking, what does success mean to me? That's success. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're rich and famous and, yeah. and have, I mean, I'm not saying none of them have self mastery. The truth is I don't know any, you know, I don't know them. I'm not really in yeah. that realm. So yeah. it's just, it's an interesting, um, like as a society, I guess, is how I was thinking of it. Is, is that yeah. true or is that yeah. like truth for me, truth yeah. for you? I, and of course, I am definitely projecting, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's not, I mean, it's, it's certainly information you can find elsewhere too. I'm convinced, um, you mentioned the TikTok thing. I think you can make a pretty good case that the fact that they're a TikTok star is evidence, is proof that they're not practicing self-mastery. If they were comfortable in their skin, they wouldn't need to put themselves out like that. I heard a guy, um, and again, a teenager, 20-year-old, I don't expect that of them, but yeah. uh, I heard a guy one time, he was the head of the, uh, I think it was the Mercedes motorsports racing team. He was like the CEO of that organization. And he said something that really struck me. He said, I've never seen uh, a truly great racer who wasn't a broken person. Mm. By definition, they only, the only people who desperately need to prove their worth will work as hard as it takes to get that good. Yeah. If you're a healthy balanced person who's satisfied with yourself in your life, it makes no sense to live like that. So I think you can see a lot of that. I'm guessing all these people, like you mentioned Congress, that was a great point. Um, you know, by by many metrics, they're successful. They're right, the leaders of the land. But um, I think there's almost zero chance that they're happy. And I think a lot of them might even know it. Some of them might be so broken that they literally wouldn't identify the fact that they're not happy. Like I'm not sure. Trump would acknowledge that he wasn't happy, but there's no chance he is. Um, he, he acts like such a desperate, needy child emotionally, you know? Um, but I, I gotta, I've got to say that the vast, 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 match, like 99% of people, um, they might not even make that link. Like we taught you articulated some of the things that the eulogy items, right? They might not be making that link. Their thoughts, their training, their societal impulses may all be pointing them to what we agree are kind of external signs of success, but they would also be super aware that they're not happy. That's the whole midlife crisis, right? I've done these things and all of a sudden I'm like, none of them are changing how I feel about myself. What the hell now? You know, what's going on? So that's my contention is that sure. actual success where they actually find some peace, peace of mind comes only from being the kind of person that actually is on balance positive to the other people in our life, you know, that they actually value us and we we serve them well. Anyway, that was a fun conversation. Yeah. And I and and, and I you know your points are perfectly. I don't think we're in any disagreement. It's just really No, can, I don't think so that, either. That phrase is so, you know, short, you can read yeah. it a bunch of ways and they're all uh applicable, so. Yeah. That's excellent. Okay. So that was our Intergame Gold. Next up, the Charging Station Challenge. All right, our challenge of the week. So last week, we had you practice what we're calling the Marshawn Lynch technique. He's a famous football running back. So it is basically look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, what kind of person do I want to be today? Went into a little more detail last time, but that's the basic idea. And uh, I think it's a great idea. So I hope that was helpful for you. So this week, I want to link uh, back to our discussion about taking action. So yes, you want to think about your big picture goals or resolutions for the year if you think about it in those kind of terms. But whatever it is you'd like to see happen, uh, I want you to specifically break those down into actions you can take this week. Not, not, not you're going to all the way there, but just something you can do now to start. Maybe it's, you know, you're going to search for a personal coach. Maybe you're going to make an appointment with a family therapist. 
Maybe you're going to download the new map and try that out, or you're going to look for a gym in your area. We reach our goals as a result of the actions we take to move toward them. So for whatever it is you'd like to see happen, put together one or two specific actions you can take this week to move things forward. That's our, that's our challenge for this week. As always, I'll post this in the community if you want to do it along with others. If you're not in the community yet, click the link in the notes. It's free to do. Just register. You can go straight into the challenge. And that's it for this week's Charging Station Challenge. Next up, highly recommended. All right, so these are things I'm crazy about right now. Books, shows, gadgets, things I love and recommend. Michelle, you go first for this one. All right, so something that I think has been good, and I actually, I'll be honest, I haven't done them all this week, but since it's the new year and we're talking about, um, it's not necessarily a resolution, but a little challenge. So um, through the New York Times, they have like this sub newsletter called Well, and it's about like wellness. Margaret's doing that same thing this week. The happiness one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know a little bit about it. So they're um, basically, it's based on a study that was done at Harvard University over 85, it's been going on for 85 years. Um, so it's multi-generational and it's grown to like, I guess I, I don't want to quote, but I, I think over a, a thousand, maybe thousands of people. And the number one thing that predicts happiness is um, people's social connections. Friends, family, it doesn't have to be a lot of people. It can just be really good quality, you know, a few good quality friendships. And so this week they're doing every day, they have a little challenge um, for you to, well, first of all, it was interesting. They had a quiz where you answer some questions and then they kind of like tell you like where you're at. Like, um, hmm. and I will say I, I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> I have some friends and good relationships. Um, and then just kind of like what you might want to focus on or where maybe you're lacking um, in your life. And so like one of them was, um, you know, text a friend and ask them if they can have an eight minute conversation because that can be really important to connect. Um, yesterday, I think was the power of small talk, you know, that it's worth like kind of your periphery friends or more acquaintances, you know, that aren't really close to you. Um, why it's good to have small talk and kind of chat. Um, I didn't read this morning's, but anyway, I, I, I think you do have to subscribe. So I feel bad a little bit um, talking about it here, but you, you can look into it if it's something that you're interested in, because I, I personally like a little challenge. I like rules. And like, once I commit to something, I'm going to you know, probably do that. And so um, I have found it really helpful every day to just think about those, like, who are my childhood friends that I'm still in touch with? How is my relationship with my husband? Who are the people that I'd like to be closer to that maybe I'm not, you know, right now? And how do I build that friendship? I feel like they address all of those things in that. And it's the number one predictor of happiness. So hmm. That's I think excellent. it can't be anything but good. So we can put a link in there. Um, Maybe they, maybe they got to pay. Maybe it's worth the five bucks. I don't remember what the yep. <laughs> what the subscription costs over there. But yeah, Margaret's really enjoying it too. And I know that because uh, I'm technically the subscriber on the account, so they come oh. to me, and I'm not triggered into watching for them. So she'll be like this morning. She's like, I didn't get my one this morning. Did you get that? So I can just tell yeah. <laughs> she wants them. She's having to reach out and get them. That's really great. And it it does sound like it's super super well thought through. I mean, the quiz at the front end. Um, the, the, just the data underneath it, the, the, the observation that our relationships really are what are so fundamental. I love it. All right. So mine is, is, uh, a little bit even superficial, I guess, but it's yeah. avatar. The oh, number two. Oh, sure. Yeah. I saw that with the family. It's, I knew we were going to want to see it cause I love the first one so much. We all did. And we actually held off on it as you know. Uh, in our little town here, we don't have a good big screen. So on New Year's Day, we drove to Lacrosse to see okay. on a big screen as a special treat. And uh, the only little fly in the ointment there was that uh, not knowing any better, we, you know, we booked the tickets in advance, and uh, we got into a, a seating that was 3D. So I had to wear those little glasses. Oh, shoot. Yeah. And those really are. I find them distracting. There were a couple moments where it was kind of cool, but overall. You know, those movies are all about the 
well, not all, but a big part of the enjoyment is the incredible visual quality of those movies. And they were just kind of dark and a little bit fuzzy. And I'm actually, even though it's incredibly long, I actually kind of want to see it again just to get that full visual beauty experience. But the, it was a great story. Uh, the whole family loved it, which, you know, it gets harder and harder, right? I mean, our kids are yep. 14 and 18 now, basically. So it, it gets harder and harder to find a movie we all want to see and that we're all going to enjoy. But we definitely yep. did. Um, it's did just you great. have just, to rewatch the first one? Like I saw the first one years and years ago, and I feel like I would have to rewatch that to really or to get the most out of the second one. Is that true? I wouldn't have thought so, but it might be because I have the story in my mind because I have watched it more than once. Margaret did say, I kind of wish I had watched that first one again because there were some things I just didn't remember what the background for this or that was. So right. might be a good idea. Might even enhance the whole experience. Because we did that. We knew it was coming out. We knew it was booked. Oh, no, wait, I'm thinking of something else. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm thinking of Knives Out. We watched that one. That's a Netflix Right, the glass you know what? onion. I'm in the middle of sequel. that. Oh yeah, the glass I'm not onion anything. one. But we we knew we were going to watch that one night. So the day before that, just over Christmas break, we watched the original, just to do those together. We didn't do that with Avatar. We probably should. Okay, were are those linked? Because I almost I I started watching Glass Onion, and I was like, who are these people? Are these the people in the original? Because I I understood it to be two separate. They're completely movies. separate. They are okay. And then the when only I looked difference... at the cast of the first one, I was like. No, these aren't the same people, and I think I can watch this without having watched the first one. Definitely, the only uh, common thread is the detective. Okay. I can't think of it. What's the actor's name right now? I can't think of it. Um, the James Bond oh, guy. Oh, James Bond. <laughs> Daniel Craig. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, he's the only thread. Okay. Yeah. So you're right; those two would go by, but I think I do think the Avatar, the first one, would would because uh, it's been so long. It's been ten plus years since I was out. I think something like I that. I think more, like twenty. It could be. Yeah. I think it is because, yeah, I was like in college. <laughs> it was 20 years ago. I heard, the, uh, I heard the funniest thing from Edie Falco. Did you hear that? No. She, so she, you know who she is, the actress. Yep. Mm -hmm. She was in the, uh, in, she's in the second one. And uh, just to give you a sense of the scope of this project, this movie, she was quoted recently as saying her scenes were shot four years ago. Yeah. It had been so long she said, I kind of thought it just came out and died because I hadn't heard a thing about it. Oh, that's funny. She was surprised that it was coming out now. Yeah, I heard an interview with James Cameron. I don't know if you listened to the podcast Smartless, but no. it's one mm -hmm. of my favorites. But anyway, he was on that podcast and just talking about how, because they have like a five, I think there's like five more movies that are yeah, supposed to come yeah. out or whatever, but talking yeah. about they've already shot because some of the kids in it need to be kids Oh, in yeah. future ones and they've already shot those but this is like a multi-year takes about two years per movie just to edit yeah. and do the sound and all of that kind of stuff so it's going to be around for a while i think yeah well that was the same thing they did with the uh the lord of the rings trilogy yep. right shot them all at once shot it all at once released yeah. them every two years god it's crazy anyway loved it yeah highly oh, recommended good. It's three hours plus, and uh, like I say, I, I probably will find a way to watch it again when I can just to get the full impact. I don't recommend the 3D experience. I don't think the trade-off is <laughs> worth it. <laughs> I'm not anyway, that is it for a highly recommended. And uh, Michelle, I want to thank you. That's the end of our show today. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah. It's really great to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. It was really fun. Yeah, hopefully we can we can do it again. All right. All right, everybody. So that's the show this week. If you like what you heard, please do tell your friends and rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Helps more people find the show, of course, and get their own mental game boost. Uh, if you prefer video, we post all our episodes on our YouTube channel as well, which you already know if you're watching this, but there's a link to that in the show notes if you're listening to the audio pod. For more mental game goodness, please join our free community the Raise Your Inner Game Charging Station. You click the link here or go to raiseyourinnergame.com slash community. It's totally free. I think you'll love that. If you'd like to support the show so we can keep things ad-free, please click the Buy Me a Coffee link below, and thank you for that. 
If you have teenagers in sports, check out our Mental Game Starter Kit Parent Edition. It's a great set of resources to get you started on the path of helping your child boost their mental game. Again, raiseyourgame.com, scroll to the bottom. You can learn about it there and register. All free, of course, super helpful resources. And finally, we'll close with Leo Tolstoy. Again, the ultimate purpose in life is to serve humanity. That's what we're doing. It's super important. Keep up the good work, and we'll see you next time.